My name is Dr. Alexa Smith. I am the Assistant Professor of German in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures at Hanover College. I would like to give special thanks to our cable channel HCTV team for, from the Communication Department who is making this event available to those who cannot be here in person. On behalf of the Hawk Center, Alumni Relations, Academic Affairs, and the Racial Justice and Equity Committee, I am pleased to welcome you to our conversation tonight in celebration of Indigenous Peoples Month. We began our conversation last night with the showing of the German documentary, Forget Winnetou, which critically addresses the negative stereotypes of Native, Native Americans as propagated in German culture. Tonight, I am honored to introduce you to Dr. Kenneth Barnett Tankersley. After only a few exchanges, I am already so grateful for the wealth of knowledge he has to share with us. Dr. Tankersley helped us identify on whose land Hanover College now resides. As he explained, the, the Miami nation resided in this region since time immemorial, and they never left. The Miami Nation of Indiana has its headquarters in Peru, Indiana, and they are still fighting today to be recognized at the state and federal levels. We have been asking ourselves, what does it mean for us to live, work, and learn on stolen land? What can be done to bring awareness to the negative stereotypes and historical trauma that the Miami and other nations have faced in the past and present? And what can we do to come to terms with this past and to collaborate to make a better present and future for all? Dr. Tankersley is an enrolled member of the Piqua Tribe of Alabama. He received his BS and MA degrees from the University of Cincinnati and a PhD from Indiana University in 1989. He did postdoctorate work at the Quaternary Studies Program of the Illinois State Museum with funding from the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the LSB Leakey Foundation, Earthwatch, the International Research and Exchange Program, the Court Family Foundation, the Charles Phelps Taft Foundation, and the University of Cincinnati Research Council. He has conducted archeological investigations across the Western Hemisphere and Eastern Siberia. This research has resulted in more than 165 professional publications, and it has been featured on the National Geographic Channel, the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, the Animal Planet, BBC Nature, NOVA, PBS, in Science National Geographic News, GEO, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker Magazine, Scientific American, Archaeology Magazine, and on All Things Considered. He has served as a foreign delegate for the National Academy of Science, a delegate of the International Geology Congress, a Carnegie Mellon Scholar, Emmons Lecturer, Guest Editor of Scientific American Magazine, and a gubernatorial appointed member of the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission. He is an associate professor in the departments of anthropology and geology, a fellow of the graduate school, and curator for the Court Archaeological Research Facility at the University of Cincinnati. His talk this evening is entitled, Native Americans, the Invisible Underrepresented Minority. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Tankersley. Thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction. And also thank you uh, for welcoming me to this beautiful university, this college. I um, absolutely love it here. So uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be speaking to you um, this evening. I'd like to introduce myself. Um, Oshio Oginali, Cha Aniyuya, Cha Pikwashawano, Cha Anidikisha, Cha Michikinaqua. It's traditional that we do a land acknowledgement. Hoyana, Oesta, Idoda, Wado. Hoyana, Oesta, Yowa. 
hoyana o esta uneklana no wato here do. We stand on the lands of the Miami, the Lenape, the Shawano, the Wendat, and other indigenous peoples whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples continue to thrive in this place, alive, strong, and growing. We collectively advocate, recognize, and support their sovereignty and the sovereignty of indigenous peoples and respect their present and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to Hanover College. I'd like to begin with is talk about who is a Native American, defining what it means to be a Native American. The legal definition, according to the United States, a Native American is defined as a person of having origins of the original peoples and who maintain tribal affiliation. This is crucial. There are federally recognized tribes, there are state recognized tribes, and there are tribes such as the, Indian, the Miami of Indiana who are neither federally nor state recognized. They are being deprived. They've never left this land. They have three reservations and their tribal headquarters are in Peru, Indiana, but they are consistently denied. Keep in mind that the indigenous people of Hawaii are not federally recognized. The indigenous people of Hawaii are not state recognized. They have no recognition at this juncture. And many indigenous people are fighting for sovereignty and recognition. Uh, as gen genomic anthropologist Kim Tolbeer has argued, being Native American is not about a genetic haplogroup. It's not talking about A, B, C, or D mitochondrial DNA. It's not talking about C or Q Y chromosome haplogroup. Or it's not talking about your percentage of Native American on an autosomal DNA print. It's not what blood type you have. Being Native American is cultural, it's not biological. And when we think about tradition, by any child that was adopted were Native American, whether or not they were considered biological members of a family. Spouses who were not Native American but lived in the community were considered members of the tribe. You can't get that out of your DNA. Now, bear in mind that beginning in 1923, what's called the Indian New Deal, the Native Americans have to talk about blood quantum. But this is not not anything new. Going back to colonization, first the Spanish, then the French, and then the British, the idea of blood quantum was a way to characterize Native Americans. By 1705, blood quantum was being used to deprive Native Americans of their basic civil rights, security, freedom of action, speech, assembly, conscious expression, religion, basic civil rights. Now, think for a minute what blood means. Of course, they're talking about being synonymous with DNA. What DNA labs were open in 1705? The first president of the United States to enforce blood quantum was Thomas Jefferson. For him, he argued that Native Americans were not intelligent enough to be educated. They needed to enrich their blood quantum with Caucasian blood. They had to dilute their blood down to one quarter, one fourth, 
And once they got down to one-fourth, they could then be educated. What DNA labs was Thomas Jefferson using? What he was using, the way it worked, was craft paper. Craft paper is brown paper bag that you get, put your groceries in. If it was laid upon the skin and you were as dark or darker than the craft paper, you were full blood. If you had half the hue of a brown paper bag, you were a half blood, a quarter, and so on and so forth. By the time you got to a quarter, you could be educated, according to Thomas Jefferson. Also, keep in mind, Native Americans are the only minority that have to have a card recognizing them. We have to carry a card showing proof of our tribal identity. How many people? You can't self-identify as Native American. You have to be an enrolled tribal member. And it was just the last century when the one drop law was enforced. People hid their Native American identity because if you had one drop, in other words, if you had Native American ancestor, you had one drop of Native American blood, you could not marry a Caucasian person. Now, I hope everyone has pen and paper. I'm a professor, I profess, I'm sorry. But I have to give you an exam, so you, you know that. I mean, first day of class, you have to give an exam. So what I'm gonna do is test your IQ this evening. I'd like to begin, and you're, by IQ, what I mean, I'm gonna test your Indian quotient. So two points per question. You get one point, if, and you keep your own score, you don't have to tell me, but you get one point if you can identify the name of the person, a second point if you can identify the tribe. All right? All right. Just, just a little bit of a way to warm up here. So, today's topic, I'll give you an easy one. All right? We're an easy one. Native American first. Easy. All right. We're going to talk about a few different first about Native Americans. It's Native American Heritage Month, right? Well, I mentioned Thomas Jefferson. Everyone knows when Thomas Jefferson was governor of Virginia and later president of the United States, right? And his participation with the founding fathers. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, you know, the, you know the back story to that one, but all right. Who was the first college graduate? And I'll give you a hint. He was also the first published writer. He graduated from Harvard University in 1665, before Jefferson was born. His name was Caleb Chihastimak, he was Wampanoag. Not only did he publish, he published in Latin. He was a college graduate and published in Latin, 1665. Now remember what I said about blood quantum. How about the first newspaper editor? Elias Boudinot, Cherokee. The first novelist, who was also the first editor of a non-Indian newspaper. John Rollin Ridge, Cherokee. the first person to be declared a person. Think about that. What year was a Native American considered a person? It was Standing Bear, Aponka. This is him 
on a ticket for the world's Columbian Exposition. This is Standing Bear at the time. He said, I am a human being. I am a person. If you cut my hand, it will bleed red the same as your hand. If you cut your hand, I am a human being. Well, he won his case. On May 12, 1879, Standing Bear was declared a person in U.S. District Court. I mean, he went up against General Crook, who lived up to his name. But it wasn't until 1879, that's after the Civil War, 1879, that Native Americans were considered persons. The first medical doctor. Dr. Susan LaFleche, 1889. She was Omaha. But I put her first. There were actually three Native Americans got their medical degrees in that same year. Another one, Dr. Carlos Montezuma, who was Yavapai. He actually came as a young boy, as a member of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And they used to come consistently to Cincinnati, Ohio, just downstream, or just upstream rather, from here at Hanover. And he met a young doctor by the name of Charles Lewis Metz, who was very passionate about the civil rights of Native Americans and all people. And he inspired Carlos Montezuma to become a medical doctor, and he followed through. He graduated from the Chicago Medical School. Whoops. And finally, Dr. Charles Eastman. He's Lakota. Dr. Eastman's first, right out of med school, ends up at a place called Wounded Knee. And after the massacre of the 7th Cavalry, the massacre of the 7th Cavalry of the Lakota, unarmed men, women, and children, he took care of the survivors. That was his very first act as a medical doctor. All right. Granted, those were a little hard. Now I'll make some easy ones. First Major League Baseball player. Now I know you all know this one, right? Louis Francis Sokalexis. He was Penobscot, Major League, the Cleveland Spiders. Ever hear of them? Of course, in 1915, they changed their name to the Cleveland Indians. Now, for a long time, Cleveland lied. They said, oh, we had a famous chief. His name was Chief Wahoo. If anyone ever been to Cleveland or seen Cleveland Indians. It was a lie. Actually, at this time, he was the first. I don't know why they don't celebrate him. He was Penobscot. But Louis Sokalexis, one of the amazing things, incredible baseball player, first minority baseball player in the United States. But he ran up against some guy named Bat Masterson. Did you ever hear of Bat Masterson? Shoot out at the OK Corral. Wyatt Earp, same Bat Masterson. After that, he went in, he became a sports writer, moved to Denver, Colorado, had a sports column, was really, loved boxing, but he claimed himself as a Indian fighter, and he hated Indians. So when the Cleveland Spiders, anytime they came up, he knew they had Native Americans on the team. So he he refused to call them by their name, the Cleveland Spiders. He called them the Cleveland Indians. By the time 1915 came around, they said, we give up. And of course, think about how long that name has stuck. How many protests have gone on? The first movie star. Lillian St. Lillian St. Cyr, Winnebago. And look who she worked for, a guy named Cecil B. DeMille. But what did she have to portray? Her Princess Red Wing. 
no such thing as an Indian princess, or the white squaw, or squaw man, as you see being portrayed here. All right. Now, I know you know this one. The first Native American vice president of the United States. That's an easy one, right? I'll give you a hint. Kansas. It was Charles Curtis. Now, a lot of people miss him because he was vice president under Herbert Hoover. And, of course, as you know about the Great Depression and not so many nice things were said about Herbert Hoover, we forget that Charles Curtis was a Caw. He had ancestry of Caw and Osage. He was a, an enrolled member of the Osage. Any dancers here? The first prima ballerina, Maria Tallchief. She was Osage. And look at the ballet companies which she founded. This is Maria Tallchief. First Grammy Award winner. Keely Smith, she was Cherokee. Some of us are old enough to remember the song, That Old Black Magic. You know. But more importantly, she's the one who performed at John F. Kennedy's inauguration. She received the Medal, Cherokee Medal of Honor in 2002. The first Hollywood Walk of Fame star. I know you know this one. Jay Silverheel Smith, Mohawk from the Kahnawake Reserve. Of course, on Saturdays, you still may see him playing what character? Tonto. Tonto. Who can tell me what the name Tonto means? It's Spanish. Anyone? Little stupid person. Do you imagine this incredible talented actor having to be called stupid person throughout the whole idea? I mean, it, the subtext of the Lone Ranger. The first orchestra conductor, John Kim Bell, Mohawk, also from the same reserve is. J. Silverheels Smith, and also from the Kanonaki Reserve. First Academy Award winner. Buffy St. Marie, Cree, a lover guitar playing. So many people know the song, but they don't remember Buffy St. Marie, Up Where We Belong. When it came out, I mean, music boxes all over the United States were playing her song. All right, here's another easy one. I know they've been hard. The first Native American astronaut. Now, I know you know that one. Probably because of what he carried into space with him. John Harrington, he's Chickasaw. The amazing thing he brought in the Chickasaw Nation flag with him to space, along with six eagle feathers and a braid of sweet grass and two arrowheads. So, what was your IQ? Anyone get a 36? 34? 32? 16? <laughs> okay. I won't ask. Okay. So, like I do with my students, I give extra credit. So, I have a couple bonus questions I've tossed in here to up your IQ. What year did Native Americans, when were Native Americans given the right to vote? When, was, when did everyone have the right to vote? Well, while 1870 granted United States citizens the right to vote, Native Americans were not given the right of vote until the Snyder Act of 1924. It wasn't until an entrepreneur 
and an owner of a very successful department store by the name of Wanamaker, who's uh, done incredible donations to the uh, museum, Mathers Museum at Indiana University. But he argued, he essentially shamed the United States in of how many people participated in World War I. You probably heard of Navajo code talkers. You probably don't realize that there were code talkers of many different tribes or the fact that there were code talkers in World War I. And because of their invaluable service to their country, Native Americans have fought and died in every war the United States has ever had. They're still fighting to this day at this moment. And I'm including the American Revolution. 1924, Native Americans could vote. Religious freedom. When did Native Americans have the freedom to practice their own ideological, their own spiritual beliefs, religion, if you want to use the term? I'd already graduated from college. 1978. This law also said we could speak our own language. You realize before 1978, we couldn't speak our language in public without being threatened of being arrested. 1978. Being able, freedom of religion was for everyone else, but not for Native Americans until 1978. How about grave protection? When was a Native American body? When were Native American human remains considered persons? You already know when living Native Americans. How about the dead? I had already had my PhD. It wasn't until 1990 that a Native American grave was recognized as the grave of a person, 1990. Now I'd like to shift to a more closer to my heart, an issue of Native American invisibility. You can't tell a Native American by looking at them because it's not biological, it's cultural. But the issue of invisibility runs deep and why? Keep in mind, Native Americans survived the genocide over 8 million people. Talk about a pandemic. Talk about a, over 8 million people died. And of course, this has been obfuscated as well as the result of colonial growth. What did the Europeans bring? They brought in alcohol, disease, and nutritionally deficient food. I mean, what happened? Dislocation, impoverishment, mass mortality, substance abuse, violence, can all be traced to this aspect of invisibility. Native Americans, it's important to remember, are the survivors. They're the descendants of genocide. And facing what I call transgenerational trauma, transgenerational trauma from stereotypes, from those of a former president of the United States, to sports mascots, which I was just referring to. And if you're not Native American or any underrepresented minority, it's hard to understand what transgenerational trauma or what we refer to as historical trauma from the perpetuation of negative stereotypes. It's painful. And when you look at historical trauma, it's something that's passed on, it's cultural, but you learn it as a child and it's passed down generation after generation it's intergenerational. 
And it affects all underrepresented minorities. I'm going to ask, uh, I ha have some, two volunteers who I would like you to hear from them words of examples of transgenerational trauma. We talked about being Indian among ourselves with family, but we never really talked about it away from home or family. We were proud of being Native, but it was just really hard with going to school with the other kids because we looked different than most of them already. It made it a little bit harder just to get through school. five or six years old when the teacher had asked us what nationality we were. I stood up in front of my kindergarten class and announced that I was an Indian. My mother was just mortified and said, why did you say that? Our grandfather was embarrassed by it. There is still a hesitancy of revealing my true identity. My uncle said, don't tell people you are native because they will take away your land and house. Just near the end of mother's life, I ask her my exact words. Your grandmother gave you an Indian name, so why didn't you give me an Indian name when I was little? Her exact response, why would I give you a name for which men would rape you, kick you, demean you? She had tears in her eyes. My mother said, no, don't tell him he is Indian because it is against the law here to be Indian and not be on a reservation. She basically said she could lose her home, her car, and her job if people knew that we were Indian and not on a reservation. My paperwork said I was of color when I was born. Of color, whatever that means. The government did this. Thank you. Just, I mean, these are heartfelt statements, and these are just small snippets from interviews in terms of just give you a feeling about transgenerational trauma and how it manifests itself deeply among people. Now, what I'd like to do is bring up, as I mentioned before, we were in discussion, what month is Native American Heritage Month? Well, it's November, and of course, what better to celebrate Native Americans than Thanksgiving? Well, I hope I don't offend anyone, but the truth is traditional Native people do not celebrate Thanksgiving. It's a day of prayer. It's a day of mourning. It's a day of quiet reflection. And you might ask yourself, why is this? Well, consider that the pilgrims were slavers. They made a living, what we call pilgrims. Their 1614, the pilgrims left Massachusetts Bay with a ship full of enslaved Native Americans. That's how they made a living. Those who survived enslavement eventually died of smallpox. From 1616 to 1619, 90%, 90% of the indigenous population of New England had died from what the Plymouth colonists called Indian fever. 
it was smallpox and other maladies for which there was no immunity. And consider in 1637, in terms of the first Thanksgiving, what was it really? What's the true story of the first Thanksgiving? In 1637, over 700 Pequot men, women, and children were gathering for their Green Corn Festival. The Green Corn Festival is a festival that many Algonquian-speaking tribes celebrate. It's a time where you don't eat maize, what well, Europeans call corn. You don't eat maize until you've had the green corn ceremony. It's a taboo. Then after it's matured, harvest of corn, now it's time to celebrate the green corn ceremony. While during this multi-day, very sacred ceremony, the pilgrims came over and while the Pequot were asleep from a day of festive activities, they ordered all the families outside. The men came out first. As they did, they were either shot or clubbed to death. The women and the children stayed inside their longhouses. The pilgrims burnt them to the ground, killing them. And afterwards, of course, the pilgrims had the food of the Pequot. It was a day for Thanksgiving. They now had food. And because 700 unarmed men, women, and children had been massacred, that's the true story of the first Thanksgiving. Now, the colonists said, we don't have to worry about food now. We can continue to do this. The colonists continued to attack Native American villages one after another. And any woman or child over 14 were sold into slavery. They were enslaved. Remember, they didn't look at them as persons. They loaded boats typically with as many as 500 Native American slaves and from the ports of New England to their home in England. Bounties were also paid for any scalps, the whole idea of scalping very early on, and it occur, encouraged additional deaths. Now, after an especially successful raid on the Pequot, the churches announced that we're going to have a second day of Thanksgiving. And during the fest feasting, they cut the heads off of Native Americans and kicked them around like soccer balls. And the chief of the Wampamog was beheaded. They put his head on a pike and stuck it in Plymouth, where it stayed until it finally decomposed and fell off. 24 years later. Because of the pilgrims, half of the remaining Native Americans in New England were exterminated. Now, the killings became more frenzied. After each massacre, there was a Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving feasts were held again and again and again. By the time you get to the founding of our country, George Washington, the first president of the United States, suggested that we have only one Thanksgiving, and it's being set aside for each and every massacre. Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, decreed Thanksgiving Day to be a legal national holiday, which is this holiday we celebrate to this day, right in the middle of the Civil War.
But that same day, he ordered military action against the Dakota in Minnesota. Men, women, and children were starving to death. The leaders were hung in a public lynching. So, what can I do? I didn't live then, right? What can I do? Well, there are some proactive things I'd like to leave you with that everyone can do. And they're pretty simple. Please do not use transgenerational words that cause transgenerational trauma. Brave. Gee, who won the World Series? What was that team's name? Have you ever seen the Atlanta Braves uniform? They have a red man on the front and a stone axe on a stick. It's 2021 and we're still talking it. Mercifully, thanks to two Dakota filmmakers who were brothers, who at least got the Washington to quit using the Redskins. So many teams have changed, but racist mascots hurt. They cause transgenerational trauma. Please never use the word squaw or shaman. It's okay to use the word shaman if you're talking about the Chukchi of Eastern Siberia. They're the only indigenous people in the world that have shamans. They have a shamanistic religion. No one else. So there are shamans among the Chukchi. It's not a word. The idea of red skin are very painful. I can't tell you how long I had to fight. Oh, Ken, we want you to teach New World prehistory. Talk about the first Americans. How can it be a new world? Native people have been here since time immemorial. We talk about new world, old world. Please know. And, or first Americans. Or talk about, oh, I have a spirit animal. I mean, Facebook, social media is full of people talking about their spirit animals. Please don't use the word chief. I've had it done so much throughout my career by people who I, colleagues I think the world of, and they think they're just having a good time calling me chief or calling a woman Pocahontas or use the word Indian giver or even something like, oh, it's going to be an Indian summer or Phrases such as, in academia, calling a department, we're going to get the tribe together. Or, let's have a talk, let's have a powwow. Or, I'm sorry, but you're the low man on the totem pole. I mean, these, these phrases are, have become ingrained in our, our colloquial language, but because of the invisibility of Native Americans, you don't know who you're hurting. And it's just good not to do it. Or talking about, oh, you're on the war path now. Or saying, funny, you don't look Native American. Or, how much Indian are you? Or, well, after all, we're all immigrants. And, oh, uh, He's going off the reservation now. Or Indians are just a bunch of drunks and thieves. Or I can't, t I heard this one this week. Indians really don't know anything about their culture. We need anthropologists to teach the Indians about their culture. Anthropologists know about it. I'm an anthropologist. I'm in an anthropology department. I hear this one. I heard that one this week. And I'd like to leave you with the words of John Trudeau, who argues that the past is more 
than a memory. As human beings, it is time to take responsibility for the power of our intelligence and to use the power of our intelligence to think coherently. This isn't about whether we can or we can't. This is about whether we will or we won't. I'll stop here. Thank you. I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. So you keep me off the hook and I don't have to answer any questions. So that's even better. So you're I said what would you say is the best way to learn about Native American cultural history in a general sense, not just an academic sense? Oh, I love it. I love it. What a brilliant question. I love your question. So what's the best way beyond not an academic sense to learn about Native Americans? What's the best way? Well, you're very fortunate. The Miami tribe of Indiana is here in Indiana. They have three l really large parcels of land. They have a tribal office in Peru, Indiana, and they have for the public ceremonies. But to engage with Native Americans firsthand. To, rather than, I, it's hard, I argue and have always argued that if you go take a course on Native Americans, it needs to be taught by a Native American. But there's no substitute with immersing yourself in Native American culture. And Native Americans are very prolific in terms of education, educational program. In Kentucky, we have the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission. Helen Dancer is the gubernatorial commissioner. And they work very hard to ensure that there are proper educational programs so the public can learn about Native Americans, be with Native Americans. And that same thing goes on here in Indiana. There's actually a, a council for Native American tribes. The Potawatomi now have a federally recognized tribe. The Potawatomi have land in northern Indiana. So you have a federally recognized tribe, the Potawatomi, and you also have um, the Miami of Indiana who, are, who have been passionately working as long as I can remember, well back into the 1970s and 80s on federal recognition. And I know they would welcome you in terms of learning about their culture. And I think it's being here at Hanover, it's ideal of learning what native people are living here together. Right now, to be quite honest, many Native Americans, we think about a stereotypic native people living on a reservation. It's kind of a catch-22. On the one hand, if you're on a reserve land, your job potentials are, are limited. The Diné, the Navajo, the Navajo Nation, they have their own college, they have their own technical schools, and the teachers are all Diné. The classes are taught in Diné. But for many tribes, that's not the case. So if you want to get a college education, you have to leave your reservation. And in doing so, all of a sudden, it puts you into a diaspora where people don't speak your language, who do not go to ceremony. I mean, there's nothing, no substitute with that. But so many people to make a living are now living in a large diaspora as many other underrepresented minority community members of many underrepresented minority communities are across the United States, and there's a disconnect. But here in Indiana, you're very lucky with the Miami tribe of Indiana and also the Potawatomi. They're in northern Indiana, but great question. Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. So. hear them. My email is smithal, so S-M-I-T-H-A-L 
at hanover.edu. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? Yes. What have been the obstacles to the Miami and Indiana being reconciled? Ah. What are the reasons given for it being done? Uh, there's nothing worse than politics. <laughs> nothing worse than politics. There's a number of ways to become federally recognized. One, judicially, you can end up in a court case where the federal judge in that court case sees you as a tribe and thus you're recognized. The President of the United States can recognize you and become federally recognized that way as well. Congress can recognize you. Or you can do as the Miami have, is petition both sides of the aisle and build their political cachet and submit beyond reasonable doubt that the Miami have been here since time immemorial. The archaeological record shows that the Miami people have been here since the quaternary, geologically speaking. They never left. Well, some of the Miami did. They were forced at gunpoint, and in some cases bayonets, to where the federally recognized Miami are in Oklahoma. Well, a lot of people escaped. You've heard of the Trail of Tears of the Cherokee. People forget there was every bit the tragic forced removal of the Miami and many other tribes. Well, the Miami and Oklahoma said, we have federal recognition. We are the real Miami tribe. You stayed behind, you gave up your tribal affiliation. Well, they didn't leave. The other big issue is the Miami of Indiana, as I mentioned several times, have large, very large plots of land, including a very sacred place on the Masinawa, known as the Pillars, where they do ceremonies there as well. They have a very large tribal office in Peru. It's unusual for a tribe which has neither federal or state recognized. So to be federally recognized, you have to, in your application, no one of the tribe can be all already a member of a federally recognized tribe. Some are. They're all eligible, but many people, I know the Heron clan chief, Tim White, gave back his federal card. He said, I am Miami of the Indi Indiana. He gave back his, his federal card because he's Heron clan chief. He's an elder of the Miami. And the United States also argues, well, have we been dealing with you over the last century? Well, actually, yeah. So far that the federal government actually made payments to the Miami of Indiana. I mean, if you understand what federal recognition means, it means there's, the government still owes something. There's a treaty and there's unresolved issues that need to be taken care of. For me, it's rather ironic that there are many tribes. In Alabama, we have tribes that started out with no recognition, then they became state recognized, and now federally recognized. Well, it's the same people, the same land, like the Miami, the Porch Creek. They've always been Porch Creek since time immemorial. They've always lived where they've lived. They've always spoke their language, always did their ceremony. But it's interesting, the uneducated public says, oh, they're federally recognized. They're real Native Americans now. They're the same people when they had state recognition or no recognition at all. So, politics. Politics. Good question. 
We have a question from online, and I'm going to repeat my email address for those who are wanting to um, send an email. Smith, A-L, S-M-I-T-H-A-L, at Hanover.edu. And the question that I've received is from a graduate student uh, working on his thesis on the representation of the Miami in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Excellent. Considering the intergenerational trauma that Native Americans face, why do those who are not Native glamorize the need to claim Native American ties? One more time. So why do they glamorize oh, there the it is. to Native American ties? Non-Native. Oh, that's, that's a powerful question. Why do non-Native people glamorize Native Americans? And I know this hits home for Alexis. The Germans early on, I think we can point to James Fenimore Cooper as a great example. James Fenimore Cooper wrote a number of novels. They were what we call historical fiction. The Pathfinder, The Deerslayer, Last of the Mohicans. Well, in Europe, especially Germany, at that time when those novels were translated into German, and they were translated into many languages, there was a great oppression among the working class. And there was something very attractive about the freedom and that connection with the land. And a lot of, a, I mentioned Dr. Charles Lewis Metz meeting Carlos Montezuma when he was a young boy traveling with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And at the time, he was the only real Native American. It was other people dressing up as Native Americans. I mean, consider in the 1960s, the most well-known Native American was a guy by the name of Chief Iron Eyes Cody. Boy, he looked Native American, but he wasn't. He had the look. Some of the most Native American-looking people I've ever met have been in Germany. They speak Lakota. They wear regalia. They practice ceremonies. Well, even more recently, Someone had a vision about being Native American. And to this day, Germany, there are more books sold about Native Americans in Germany than any other country in the world. That's remarkable to me. But one of, uh, one of my favorite authors was Bind Deloria Jr. And he wrote a great book about anthropology called Custer Died for Your Sins. Among many, he he's, uh, was very prolific. But his son is a professor at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, in the history department. And he wrote a book called Plain Indian. I don't know how many of you were in or are involved in Boy Scouts. powwow drums in the Boy Scouts, dressing up in Indians. It's ingrained early on. We just had Halloween. How many people could go to a costume store and dress as a Native American? There's this long-term fascination. It's interesting that there's a dichotomy between the noble savage and the heathen savage. And anthropology, the, one of the fathers of American anthropology is a guy by the name of Lewis Henry Morgan. He wrote a book called League of the Iroquois. And the most primitive of societies that he wrote of, well, he, he, he tried to classify the development into civilization. He was from Rochester, New York. He started out with savagery and then moved up to barbarism 
and of course, eventually to the civilized. And he was working with the Iroquois. So there's either this idea of, oh, as we saw Lillian St. Cyr, a Native American princess, talking about royalty to the other end, these are heathens. They need to be, they're not even persons. So, and I think that still exists to this day. It's an excellent question. And the Miami faced that. I, I would argue too, if you want to meet the Miami at a sacred site, which is their ancestral site, it's called the Mounds. It's a state park near Anderson, Indiana. Just as their ancestors did in the past, they have a summer solstice ceremony. And you, the public is invited. They go there, drum, hear their traditional songs. I think it's a good way to participate, but it's a wonderful question. Yeah. What are some things that Hanover College and our larger community can do to recognize and honor the indigenous people that lived and still live here? Hmm. Excellent. This is, that's such an important question. And it's true of all colleges and all universities. What can they do? And I would argue it's about representation. Representation, equity, inclusion, and increasing diversity. For me, at my stage in the career, those are the three most important things that any educational institution can do. Equity, inclusion, and diversity. Include Native American faculty encourage Native American students. There's a wonderful program. One of the things which I do with our tribe is help our young people find a way to go to college. I help them with scholarship applications, show them what's available. So I, I think the idea of recruiting, not just Native Americans, but all underrepresented minorities, encourage the growth of the student population and faculty as, as well. But the other thing, as we mentioned very early on in the presentation, is to remember that Hanover College is on the land of the Miami. And many other indigenous people recognize, as you have done this evening, as we have talked about this evening, of think about and educate others about the cultural, technological, scientific contributions of Native Americans. Make them part of the discussion. It's important, that's where inclusion comes in. Good question. I have been under the impression that when Europeans first came to the Americas, that they called the people they found on these shores India, Indians, thinking they had found India. If there is any truth to that, it makes me wonder at the use of the term Indians rather than Native American. Uh, this, what term should you use? Native American is the correct term. But I also remind people it's the American Indian movement So, I mean, a lot of times in emails within the tribe, we use Indian spelt capital N, small d, small n, Indian. Or even talking about within ourselves the word skins. They thought, we can't get it out of People are using it in a derogatory way. But Native American is the proper term. It, it, is, it is the proper term. But I mentioned Vine Deloria. 
and he interviewed an anthropologist. It's in the book, Custer Died for Your Sins. And the anthropologist, Vine Deloria Jr., Lakota, and asking, the anthropologist asked, this land, what did you call it before Europeans showed up? He said, ours. One answer, ours. How can we find out more about the indigenous people who lived in this place, such as the Delaware? Ah, the Lenape, absolutely, the Delaware. Uh, the Delaware have lived, um, there are, in order to learn about, and this comes back to your great question in the beginning, is a good way to see what tribes are out there. What are the federally and state recognized tribes? I suggest that you go to the National Congress of American Indians. They're our support group. The national, they're in Washington, D.C., the National Congress of American Indians. I think the, the website is www.ncia.org, I believe. But you can Google National Congress of American Indians. And when it comes up, scroll across the top and it'll say tribal list. Click on the tribal list and it's listed in alphabetical order. And when you click on, for example, the Delaware or the Lenape, it'll give you a direct link to the tribal website. And you can contact directly. That's a, that's a great question. It's a, it's a one-stop connection for accessing tribal information and making tribal connections. You stated that, the repre that representation is important, but what about false representations, uh -huh. such as statues of fictitious Native American chiefs, example, Chief Muncie in Muncie, Indiana? Oh, a absolutely. There, the, it's a naughty issue. It's a, it's, a, it's a naughty issue. Federally recognized tribes do not like State-recognized tribes. State-recognized tribes exist because of the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment isn't going anywhere. But then state-recognized tribes look down upon unrecognized tribes. Well, the Miami of Indiana do not have, they have neither state nor federally recognized tribes recognition. There are people out there who would say, they're fake Indians. But they haven't left anywhere. They've run their DNA. They know who they are. They've been here since time immemorial. But this idea of pointing out who's a fake Indian and who's not looms large. But people dressing up in regalia, um, God, I'm hesitant to say it, but I think the world, on one hand, is a musician and a singer, a Juilliard-trained performer by the name of Steven Tyler, an Aerosmith. I love playing the song. I'm a guitar player. I love playing Dream On. But I cringe when he comes on stage with a feathered headdress. That's very different. It's, it's interesting, Stephen has Cherokee ancestry, but he's not an enrolled member of the Cherokee tribe. So what do we do? Is it false representation? Or recently, I was interviewed when the Walt Disney movie, The Lone Ranger, came out. And who played Tonto? Johnny Depp. He has Native American ancestry. 
but he's not an enrolled member of the tribe. The Native American actors, who were federally recognized Native Americans, embraced Johnny Depp, but many people would, were in outrage because they said, fake Indian, it needed to be actual representation. Cher. Cher performs with a feathered headdress. We all have loved Cher growing up, people my age, and her song Half Breed. I know many Cherokee artists, guitarists and singers who sang that song. But, and Cher has Cherokee ancestry. She has Native American ancestry, but she's not an enrolled member of a tribe. So what about representation? Johnny Cash would get up, he performed when his album Bitter Tears came out, he performed at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota where the Wounded Knee Massacre occurred. And he acknowledged that he had Native American ancestry but he was not a member of an enrolled tribe. But it raises issues about representation. And it, it's, it's an important question. And it comes back now, are they, are they active members of an enrolled tribe or not? And how much do we accept? You can go online to a list of musicians. You can Google Native American musicians and Google Native American actors, and it'll give you a long list. Some are enrolled members of tribes, many are not. Where does it, I mean, where do we draw the line? It's a, it's, it is truly a naughty issue. Yeah. Yeah. Great question, these are, these are wonderful questions and important ones too. What is your opinion on non-Native Americans writing about Native Americans in fiction? Can it be done respectfully, or is it always cultural appropriation? Oh, you have great students, so that's all I can say. Very bright students. The faculty should be proud. So, very important question. The best way to answer that is a tewa a Pueblo-speaking tribe in New Mexico. A Tewa by the name of Alfonso Ortiz. He was a professor at the University of New Mexico at Albuquerque. He did his PhD at the University of Chicago, and he wrote a brilliant dissertation called The Tewa World. I'm not going to recite the entire doctorate dissertation, but the thesis of his doctorate dissertation, and later the University of Chicago published the Tewa World as a book. You can go to the library or you can get it online, get it on Amazon. It's a good read. But the thesis of it is that you can learn the Tewa language. You can come and live at our Pueblo you can eat Pueblo food. If invited, you can participate in our ceremonies. But you'll never be Tewa. And that's with transgenerational trauma. I know of no way of, if you haven't experienced transgenerational trauma, I have no way of explaining what it, feels like. And that's what Alfonso Ortiz spent his life explaining that many, many non-Native American anthropologists studied the Tewa. And this hits archaeologically as well. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a ceremony. You know, growing up, I thought, I'm going to become a scientist. I'm going to a college. I'm going to be the first person, I'm first generation, first person to go to college. And the older members of the family wanted to tell me about my culture. My grandmother had 
a language that we were only speaking in the house. I thought she made it up. When my great-grandmother said that my seventh great-grandfather was Dotsawa and they murdered him, I, it changed me it, to hear that story. But after a while, they were stories. They didn't have any meaning. I wanted to become a scientist. I was going to become an archaeologist and try and an anthropologist and become what it means to find the real ancestry, the real culture. Well, I'm a tenured professor, I'm an archaeologist, and there's now thousands of Native American archaeologists, and I'll tell you, and I go to ceremony, and I sit around the circle, whether it's spring bread, fall bread, green corn, I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at the ground. And I'm asking myself, how much of this could we dig up and figure out? And I said, well, people dropping a bead, we'd find a bead. We'd find the wood charcoal in the hearth. We'd find the post molds for the arbor. But we can't dig up the ceremony. We can't dig up the dance. We can't dig up the language. In other words, we need to learn Native American culture from Native Americans? So, good question. Yeah. Yes? Um, is there anything you can do, like donate or anything to any organization to do talking and or black resources? Ah. And it's, also tell us what is your activism? Ah, very good. Very good. At, at the first one, is we're going into a winter. And for many of us, even if you can't afford it, we have access to Salvation Army, Goodwill. I mean, most of my furniture, most of my life came from either Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, thrift shops. You can clothe yourself and you can get furniture. Many tribes, especially the large land-based tribes, don't have access to those. At Pine Ridge, for example, there are young children who are facing winter who just to get to school don't have warm coats. Now, that's a commitment. Having clean, warm clothing doing a clothing drive. But people say, okay, we, we get the clothes. All right, who's going to drive them out to Pine Ridge? Who's going to pay the $1,000 in shipping? Same way with food drives. They're very good and very, very important. And you do, the problem, the good thing about the internet is quick connection. The bad thing about the internet is quick connection because you don't know who you're connecting with. It's best to work directly with the tribes and you can access the tribe with the National Congress of American Indians to connect you with the website and find who to be in contact with. So it's great to think, I love the fact you're thinking proactively. So that's really, really uh, important. So, but the working in terms of just, I mean, we think about, did you do your homework or not? You didn't think about, are you going to make it through the winter? Are you going to freeze to death? I'll give you a, a good example. Um, my friend Steve Black Bear, he grew up on the r reservation in Browning, Montana. He's Blackfeet. His mother was Cree, his father was Blackfoot. And I connected him with a philanthropist who very generously, we talked about this very thing, about warm coats. And so he didn't want to, he wanted to cut a check. Here's, here's a check for thousands of dollars. Where are you going to cash it? So the next thing it was decided, we'll, we'll buy visas. 
will get thousands of dollars worth of visas cards like you can get at the grocery store. So he got a big stack of visas. And they went off to Pine Ridge to an incredible woman by the name of Tiny who runs a safe place for at-risk children. Native Americans have one of the highest rates of suicide. And, I mean, at Pine Ridge, there were multiple children, still are, killing themselves in weekly, weekly. So she provides a safe place. And Steve Black Bear runs a foundation, You Are Not Alone. And specifically for Native Americans thinking about committing suicide. So he goes out to Pine Ridge regularly and works with tiny, not only for at-risk children, but also families who have lost a child and working with them. Well, out he goes with a big stack of credit cards. They're given to Tiny. Everyone's elated. Off to Rapid City to buy the children brand new coats. They looked at the children and said, where'd you get those cards? We're not going to accept them. Visas! We're not going to accept them. Eventually, it was worked out. The children got the clothing. But for them, it was life or death of getting through that winter. So, I mean, those, I always think about, you know, step number one, stay alive. Step number one, stay alive. So we think about all these other things where just daily survival, I mean, there's your, your place to be proactive. Of just help, helping keep Native Americans alive. I mean, you run the risk of many young Native Americans, not surprising, don't want to be Native American. As I mentioned, they're ashamed of who they are and what they are because of transgenerational trauma. They don't learn the language, and we're losing. There are tribes where there's one speaker of the language left, one fluent speaker. California has an incredible density of Native American tribes. By the way, they're state recognized. The Ohoni of San Francisco, they're state recognized, they're not federally recognized. Took Alcatraz. Or when you think of the largest tribe in North Carolina, it's not the Cherokee, it's the Lumbee. And at the National Congress of American Indian, the lawyer is Lumbee state-recognized tribe. But it doesn't matter if it's federal, state-recognized. The key is helping keep Native Americans alive. And I think the children are a good place to begin. I think the children. So it's a, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I think we have time for one more question. What are, na what are native land acknowledgments, oh sorry, let me try that again. <laughs> Why are native land acknowledgments important and what is the best way for Hanover College to implement them consistently and respectfully? Yeah. I, I think the land acknowledgement that I put forth, this is 2021. As Alexis shared with me a really profound article is many Native Americans, land acknowledgements are causing transgenerational trauma. I read one this week where it started out with the Treaty of Greenville, which gave up the land from that side of Indiana on through Ohio to the Atlantic, cutting through a major part of eastern North America. We acknowledge the signers of the Treaty of Greenville. Actually, many colleges and universities actually have that. Why would a Native American, a group of people, want to hear the acknowledgments of being dispossessed of their land? 
are saying, oh, this used to be your land, now it's ours. We're going to take good care of it. Get the problem? So now we like to look at land acknowledgments of like I shared in the beginning. That reminding that native people have traditional ties to the land in the past and today. But more importantly, the reason I showed you the Native American first, plus to have fun, is uh, play a game, test your Indian quotient, but was also to share with you the acknowledgement of Native American contributions. So I think by acknowledging Native Americans, Native American students, Native American faculty, the contributions of Native Americans to what's now Hanover College, I think is very important. But please, the thing is not to, oh, this used to be your land, but now it's ours. Those are not good land acknowledgments, but they are important. They're absolutely important. So important that every presentation, I don't know of any Native American who doesn't begin, if they're teaching class, the beginning of class, first day of the semester, do a land acknowledgement. It should be posted, not only hard copy, but on the internet, on the website as well. So people know that you have respect. And that's the big issue. It's, it's, I mean, talk about so many archaeologists are bothered by the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriations Act called NAGPRA. And at most universities and museums, is it the Native Americans in charge? No, it's the non-Native people who take charge. Or writing land acknowledgments. Do the Native Americans write it? No, the non-Native write the land acknowledgement. So they're important, but Native people would not make the argument about losing their land. Again, that just creates more transgenerational trauma. So it's, a, it's an important thing. It's very important to have an acknowledgement, but not one that's archaic. So maybe 20 years ago, but this is 2021. I always like to think about being proactive and looking for the future. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Tinkersley. This was really wonderful. Yeah, thank you for having me.